So, are we on? We're on. Good. And it decided to work. Good. Any question from uh, last week, the weekends, the readings? Okay. I spaced Before over. I read it? Yeah. Well, okay. I just I spaced over one page and I rambled on for like about two and a half pages. Do you want me to edit that down? No. Thursday? It's all right. It's fine. It's cool. So I have a speed problem. <coughs> Certainly attested to my driving record under the influence of caffeine. I revert to my Los Angeles school of paranoid driving. That is, the other guy is an idiot trying to kill you. The only play safe place is ahead of the pack, accelerating away. So every place is a freeway. So it's not exactly a speed problem, I just go fast. So if you're having trouble keeping up, slow me down by asking that next question. Sometimes what you think is uh, philosophy is actually instructions. So as an example, people come to me and they do various behaviors which are, my training says, are symptomatic. So if you, for example, drink half a bottle of vodka and, ate, and eat eight bars of Xanax, that's a problem, but that's a symptom. So I'm not going to marvel why you're alive at 17 when you do that, but I'm going to ask you why, what is the unexamined pain that you're experiencing that causes you to think that eating eight bars of Xanax and half a bottle of vodka is normal behavior for a 17-year-old? Because if you're like trying to kill yourself, but not really wanting to kill yourself, that is a behavior with a certain end. So examine it, right? That's not philosophical. That's, like, that's straight pharmacology. Why do that? I mean, if you understand when we get to looking at uh, dosages of alcohol and all that kind of stuff, you know, everybody would see that eating three quarters of a bottle of aspirin is a suicide attempt. But they don't think drinking a case of beer is a suicide attempt. That's a lifestyle choice. Like, why do you think it's a lifestyle choice? Do you believe Anheuser-Busch over the American Medical Association? Huh. Why is that? And why aren't you questioning that? Hmm. So it's not philosophy, it's instructions. Skill building, and sometimes the skill is a concept or a conceptual tool, right? So, how many of you swim? Okay, so you swim laps in a pool, but you don't do big wave surfing. Well, what? It's okay, you don't have to answer why, but I'm saying the skills that you learn in a swimming pool are useful in a river or an ocean. But even the waves at, you know, Lively Swim Park Center are, you know, they're like two foot <laughs> waves. Very little, you know, maybe, yeah, they're three foot waves, maybe two foot of face, maybe. Okay, they're nothing like surfing in a real ocean, especially big wave surfing. 60 foot face or more, right? I'm breaking on coral, so. You know, if you wipe out, you're instantly 60 feet underwater. And you better <laughs> be able to swim out of that or die. And they aren't suicidal, that's just a level of skill in terms of swimming. The analogy is this, all right? You, uh, we are not necessarily taught life skills or the things that we will face. We're just not. Like, where do you go, you know, like, you know, I'm a grandparent now, so, you know, parenting school, I'm glad that, you know, my kids are not jail, or, you know, all the, the nasty things, and they've grown up, re you know, relatively successfully. 
but you know, we don't go to parenting school. And what are you supposed to do when you have, you know, six, three of the five major stressors going on at once and you have to go to school full time? Who teaches you how to do that? Well, sometimes the skill building, the skill is a basically a conceptual tool. And a conceptual tool that leads to action or behavior. So if you thought I used meth, no, never. Maybe once in bad acid, or was it ecstasy? So the concept is that we talked about last week was self-medication. You're in pain, so you take something to relieve it, or forget it, or induce amnesia, forgetfulness, because it was so horrible and violating. Except that you, you kind of misremembered what the trauma was in the beginning, because that's part of what the brain does, shuts down while you're having the event, so that you can survive the event. Now, the, tr the problem with that trauma is that it comes up. And it'll come up in ways that are coded so that you can look at it. You know, weird dreams or flashbacks or things like that. It's always a tip off when people can't remember portions of their childhood that they normally should remember if there's no brain damage or whatever. Okay, there's a block on it. All right, so, so again, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happens to you. So usually what happens then is people take a drug or combinations of drugs to help them forget. And so, you know, eight bars of Xanax and half a gallon of vodka or whatever. Take the dog's barbiturates. <laughs> yeah, okay. Nothing I ever ever heard of before, but it's there. It is. Or you know, they, whoever they is, think you have a problem, and their solution is to give you a drug that manages your behavior for you. So you either manage your behavior yourself, or they give you something that manages your behavior for you. All right. So if you've been around me. Well, you've only been around me, most of you, for a few hours. So the reason I ended the other day with some various breathing exercises is to teach you that basic skill outside of a swimming pool about breathing. Okay, Because it's a scientific fact that your brain, your emotions, are basically chemical states, and you can change those chemical states simply by changing your breathing pattern to start with. And then we add some conceptual frameworks to basically have you be able to negotiate things. Like, you know, if somebody dies in your family that's close to you, that grieving process is going to take like five years. Forget it being over, oh, once you, you should be over it once the funeral's over. No. Not if you cared for them, and it'd be okay to like actually feel it for five years or more, if that. I mean, it might be more, depending on how traumatic or how unjust or whatever the thing was. So for example, this, this particular technique, what I call count to 10 Zen, it came out of uh, Zen Buddhism practice, very beginning practice, you breathe from your diaphragm. On your in-breath, you count one. On your out breath, you count two. The goal is to count to 10 without having any other thoughts other than the breath. And if you have another thought, start over. I had this in a class once, a Zen meditation class. I got, you know, four credits, college credit for it. It took me three months to get to 10. And then of course, oh, I got to 10. <laughs> got to start over. The idea is actually not just the numbers, but be paying attention to what your mind is doing and your emotions. That skill. So relax and watch the process of your mind. Another one, 
yogic specific breathing uh, came out of a mystical branch of Islam, actually, but Sufi practice is older than Islam anyway, but many Sufis are associated with Islam. Five element breath, the earth breath, you inhale and exhale through the nose, the water breath, you inhale and exhale, inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth, fire breath, inhale through the mouth, exhale through the nose, air breath, inhale through the mouth and exhale through the mouth, and then the either breath, inhale and exhale through the nose so that the breath makes no sound at all. So you can't hear it. There's some <clears throat> nature awareness things that I do. I go out in the woods, walk along a trail, have your breath be the loudest sound that you make. So you can't hear your footsteps. and walk. So that the loudest sound that you can make is your breathing. Tricky. It takes breath control, coordinating, your mind, body. This does something. This changes your consciousness to be able to do that. Extends your hearing. First of all, like at least 200 feet just to do this for 100 feet around you. And you begin to realize, especially if you go out into a desert or something like that, how much noise is in your natural environment that you kind of shut down. Kundalini yoga, they talk about long, deep breathing and or breath of fire. All right, so pills are not skills. Uh, our society doesn't really teach you how to use your body. I mean... People have more awareness of how to program their cell phones than to how to avoid a cold or a flu. And that's always been a, a thing with me in terms of like dealing, especially, you know, in, you know, I've been a drug counselor, and so one of the things that a drug counselor gets in addition to people's drug problems is the first time they had sex, or gay and lesbian kids you know, coming out to me first. Or I'm the one that finds out about the pregnancy before you tell your mom. Like, okay, there's something wrong with that. I mean, I'm, thank you for trusting me, but you really should be talking with your mom about that first. And it's kind of screwed up that you're freaked out. I understand you're freaked out. Yes, but... So pills are not skills. Society teaches you to self-medicate using substances, pills, or processes because that's more profitable than teaching you to be internally self-reliant. They do. So Buddha said, life is suffering. He wasn't having a bad day. Just telling you truth. Yeshua said, you know him by his Greek name, Jesus, you suffer because you love what deceives you. Acquire my peace within you. And basically, both of them are talking about, among other things, breath practice in some of their teachings. So what's his peace? So self-mastery within each breath and knowledge, skills, and the wisdom to know the difference, for example, from the serenity prayer. So society doesn't necessarily teach you that you have the skills to be internally self-reliant. You don't need any of this external stuff. You do need relationships with other people, but you definitely need a relationship with yourself. All right? And so some people have more relationship with Siri or their Facebook page than their internal emotions. So, self-medication. <clears throat> All right, so you take a drug or combinations of drugs to help you feel you know, the amnesia, or you buy something to help you feel more in control or powerful. The yeah, whole thing about retail therapy. Okay? So it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Suffering needs a context to be integrated. 
into your life so it has meaning. You need to see the source of the suffering and the pain and the course of the suffering, like where it's going, where it's been and where it's going, and basically choose, be able to be in a position to choose the course that it's going. And the things you do to relieve the pain or keep from reliving the pain. I think I told you about my Disneyland experience, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I've had to take my kid back there. Right? And I said, oh, no, we can't go on this ride because I got traumatized when I was seven and she's like eight. Uh, no, that, I'm gonna have to go through it. Oh, let's, so, which cup do you want to, I want purple, the color of purple, okay, let's go. And that was, you know, I remembered what that, ha what happened, because I'd also just written that piece about it, and okay, don't have to relive the suffering, but now the suffering is placed in context. I'm not that little kid I had back up with me, had people to protect me say, all right, there are some people that are just not going to like you. Oh, wow. Well. There's even more that do. All right? So to keep from reliving the pain, the pain has to be put in a context that makes sense so that it actually can make you stronger rather than destroy you. So inside the pain is the key to relieving it. taking algebra? One person? What is algebra? What language is algebra? Arabic. Arabic. And what does algebra mean in Arabic? Why am I talking about math? <laughs> okay, look. Have you, any of you ever read a book called uh, The Phantom Tollbooth? It's a kid's book, The Phantom Tollbooth, okay? So there, there's this kid, Milo, who f suddenly finds this car, and he drives, in, and this tollbooth isn't in this room, and he gets in the car, and he starts driving, and he's transported into this magical world that's ruled by two opposite kingdoms, <laughs> okay? One uses words, and one uses numbers. And the kingdom of the numbers, you can't use words. You have to use equations. And the kingdom of words, you can't refer to numbers, right? Numbers and words are both ways of describing reality. Numbers just describe reality in a way that words can't. 